everybody's always focused on the red and the blue, and later research has come along and started to show that maybe there's other wavelengths that are of importance. Uh, McCree was one of the fir first per people that usually is cited as uh, the wavelengths that we should be selecting. Uh, and part of the research that he ended up doing was actually defining what PAR was. So it was defined as between 400 nanometers to 700 nanometers. Uh, but most people want to say that between the 500 to 600, which is the green spectrum, is not quite as beneficial because the plant reflects a lot of that light. And we're finding that as we start looking to that, the, the actual efficiency of the plants through the green spectrum are actually quite high, specifically as we get to the, the amber wavelengths. And so the potential of actually using amber for growing plants is exceedingly high. Uh, the McCree curve shows that that's a, a possibility. And then research that we've been doing at McGill University has actually shown that it's probably one of the most beneficial wavelengths for plant growth, at least from a photosynthetic standpoint. If you're after secondary compounds, there's other factors that are driving that. But as a base level photosynthesis, then it's the amber light that drives that. Uh, if you look at the, the work that Bruce Bugby has been doing, which is on the Emerson effect, so this is the impact of far red as it starts to push into the infrared possibilities. Uh, we typically saw that in the McCree curve, it kind of drops off and it basically goes to zero. There's no good photosynthesis that seems to happen with that. Uh, but the work that he's been doing and has just been recently published shows that uh, uh, if, if you take a far red wavelength of light and blend it with other wavelengths of light and exactly what the ratio is still has to be debated it seems to have a beneficial effect so it's almost you need to have one photon of blue light with one photon of uh, far red will actually give you the same result as two photons of blue of a red light so it seems to result in the same kind of effect on this one if we provide just far red, there's no photosynthetic activity or almost zero photosynthetic activity that happens, but the, the potential of actually blending different wavelengths of light. So there are some growers that like to say, well, I'm going to give far red light and it has this beneficial impact to my plant. You're giving a bit of infrared, so you're increasing your temperature, but you're not driving photosynthesis with that. But if you're blending it with background sunlight or other wavelengths of light, so like a white LED, uh, amber LED, or some other kind of LED, now you're getting this benefit. So the Emerson effect is an additive effect, but it is not a standalone effect. So the lighting systems that are being made now, are they not truly effective? Do they, not, are, do they have too much red and not enough other colors or amber? So. There's an ongoing debate between whether or not we should be like a full spectrum, very similar to sunlight is the one option. The other one is saying that, well, maybe we need to have a, the proper ratio of red to blue or have these other wavelengths in it. Uh, what we're finding in our lab is that there's certain wavelengths that seem to be detrimental. They don't seem to provide much benefit for photosynthesis. Uh, and then outside of those ones, so I'm finding that this happens kind of right, um, well, it actually varies. There's a bunch of different places. 680 is the easy one to cite. Um, but as you start bringing in these other wavelengths, then having different ratios of them actually have benefits to them. But I can't, at this point, I don't think we've moved far enough to say that we need 1% UV, 5% um, blue, and then add all these things together. When we have added our wavelengths together into one big group, we actually get a, a less photosynthetic active pro productivity out of them than if we would have done just single wavelengths by themselves. So how can growers take this information and put it to practical use? What can they do? Can they use it to, uh, in their uh, purchasing decisions, in, in the types of lights that they use, how they use them? How can they use it practically? Yeah, so I get that question a fair bit about how, how should growers actually use this. I'm, my normal reaction is that typically HPS is still a preferred choice. It's a good choice and no grower will actually do poorly with that. Metal halide is also a respectable choice. I find it a little bit weaker than the, the high pressure sodium, but still a respectable choice. The broad spectrum fluorescent lights that you get from white LEDs are also very strong and their efficiency is now surpassing a lot of these other ones. So purely from an efficacy efficiency standpoint, it's an easy one. Um, if you're wanting to start to push up other compounds, so if you're after the THC, the CBDs, etc., out of this, then there is starting to be a bit of research and it's early stages, but we're showing that specific wavelengths, predominantly UV, can actually push up some of these effects. Um, 
If you ask me a year from now, I'll give you a more in-depth answer, but right now it's, it's still early stages. But clearly people are interested in developing those other cannabinoids and compounds. Of course. I mean, that's the future, uh, isn't yeah. it? So, yeah, of course. Yeah. So within the cannabis market, being able to understand how each one of the compounds is being impacted, the challenge is that ultimately they're part of a biological pathway. And so if we're shining one wavelength, we're probably stimulating a certain pathway, but we might be losing other compounds. So if you want to push up your THC, you might be dropping off your CBD. So so there's a lot of interrelationship that's happening between these compounds. So that means there needs to be a lot of testing done? Correct. And so they're very much um, um, cultivar dis dependent, location dependent. Um, and so and grower, how the growers uh, are growing the plants also dependent. So some growers will be able to say, well, I don't need to do this because I'm doing these other tests that allow me to, or other um, environmental parameters that allow me to bring these things up. So it, they kind of play with each other. Does, does any of this change in a mixed light situation where it's like a light depth situation where you've got sunlight and real lights, does that affect this? It, it does. So within a greenhouse situation, we typically pull out the UV light. And so then we're, we're changing a lot of the cannabinoid accumulation from that standpoint. So adding a bit of UVA would actually be beneficial or using a plastic um, covered greenhouse it doesn't have the same impact. So you don't need to add the, the UV. If you're doing it indoors, then you do have to play with those two different parameters. So what, one just comment, the, 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 what you were saying about like the far red stuff like in conjunction with other wavelengths, it's almost like the equivalent of the entourage effect, right? So like Agreed. a CBD isolate is not as effective as a full spectrum medicine in terms of being efficacious. Uh, so, so we know that there will be certain wavelengths that will be beneficial individually. Um, but there's also some cases that if I add the wrong wavelength, it will be a detriment to the whole environment. To the, to the entourage. To, to the entourage. If I can pull that wavelength out, then I will be beneficial. So right now, it, it is almost a, um, you can't just say, I'm gonna add another wavelength and it's gonna be beneficial. It has to be more of a, a understanding some are negative and some are positive. Do, does that mean that the entourage effect that that, that it's being misused or mis that people are, are referring it to some t at, at times and maybe not providing it? Uh, well, the challenge with the entourage is that it, it's used as a catch-all to describe everything that we don't understand. And so because we know just using, like if we say just THC unto itself has these benefits, but if we do it as a medical trial, we don't see it. So we're trying to explain something because the science hasn't got to the point that we can explain what's happening. So I won't say it's misused, it's just we're, we're trying to interpret farther than we have a true understanding of at this point. Have you done any research on kind of different spectrum for different stages of plant growth or for different cultivars? Yeah, so that one's a... We know that there will be stage effects on the plant. So as they're a young seedling, um, or if you're going to be doing um, grafting or uh, tissue culture, there is different wavelengths you should be pushing for that. As you're starting, as, pardon? Such as? Um, so I'm after a broad spectrum white early on, not any, no UV, um, and I'd say stay away from the, the, the far red initially. As it starts to push up, now you're starting to get more development of roots and you're wanting to push into these other things. You can start bringing in more of these other factors which has certain stressors and other parts. But then as you start going to the full flowering events, now you're, that, that's a, ultimately a stress effect that we're wanting to do. So the accumulation of the cannabinoids and the terpenes are purely a stress defense mechanism. And so we want to start to stress the plant in some form at that point. And so higher levels of UV light actually is beneficial, possibly changing the, the temperature of the leaf so that'd be the the far red or the near uh, infrared type places will actually start to push these things and so that becomes more of a grower decision at that point what about for people who are just running nurseries or uh, you know genetics or, or just clone operations like a dark heart uh, is all is uh, um is this information relevant to them as well? So, uh, so usually if you're just propagating up to the veg stage, yeah. then it's just usually a broad spectrum white, usually covers most of what you need at that point. Um, there's probably special cases where they want a certain coloration or leaf structure or morphology, then you can start to play with those, but majority of people aren't after that. What about plants that are grown for specific purposes, like to make uh, um, uh, hash, I know, uh, or or different products. Is uh, are the light requirements different, or uh... so? 
this is, it actually gets into a larger question on this, and I'm starting to see, there starts to be a bit of a segregation. So there's field-based production, uh, which is a very, I won't say random is the right, but it's a more natural, broad spectrum. Everything is being provided to the plant, but it also provides a lot of variability. So it's like I'm um, drinking wine, and so a 1992 wine is different than a 1993 wine kind of perspective. Yeah. And so if you want the consistent same level of production, then you have to be able to control all the wavelengths in the full environment. If you're wanting to have that variability, then, the, and so for some cases of the people who are the connoisseurs, they'll be after that variability because they want the top end. But the ones who are after a consistent medicinal product that's always providing the same level of pain relief or whatever they're after, now we have to start to control that more finely. Those sound like they're they're almost two completely different crops and almost completely different industries. They'll have to they'll have to start to treat them as totally different production systems. Greenhouses, in some cases, for very high precision of like the secondary compounds, not your primary CBD or your THC, will have to be even more finely controlled at that point. And so I can see as we start pushing down and understanding what the the, the sub compounds are in the cannabinoids that we're going to have to be exceedingly fine in how we actually control the environment to maintain that those medicinal properties. Well, somebody who's more on the adult side doesn't need quite that resolution. And then, if you're going to be doing extracts for um, where you're already balancing them afterwards, then it's you don't have to be even so. So you close. do think that there will be production processes that will be able to produce cannabis that is like totally consistent, like a pack of cigarettes or yeah. something. Really? Yeah, so, so under full controlled environment, we find consistency, as long as you can maintain your genetic stability through the system, then you'll be able to hold the same consistent results. And yet genetic stability, my understanding is that the genetics sort of degrade over time, you know, when they're, they're not allowed to express themselves fully or change. So, or so genetics, there's, there's always a slight mutation that will occur. And so, but we see that within like the brewery industry also. So with yeast, we know that they're always drifting slightly. So if you take like a company like Coors, they spend a lot of money trying to maintain their base seed stock, um, which is their yeast. And so it's going to be the large producers that will be doing the Coors like uh, Coors like products will have to have that same level of trying to maintain their stability. There might have to be some back crossing to try to get it back. They'll be doing genetic sequencing to maintain this, and so trying to hold that quality all the way through.